Matt Bailey here on location in Topton, PA at the home of Evelyn Adam, matriarch of three generations of ventriloquists. That includes her, her daughter Marion, and Marion's daughter Jenny. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you. It's great to be here today. Thank, Thank you for having me in your home. Now, I want to begin at the beginning. Evelyn, how did you get started in ventriloquism? Well, we, we went to Dorney Park one time and saw a show there and there was a ventriloquist there and when I saw him perform I thought oh that looks easy I believe I can do that myself so I got the address from him where to send for one and so he told me he gave me the address and I sent to Glendale California for a little boy and so when I have my when I did my shows I said we had four girls and no boys so I sent to Glendale California for a little boy <laughs> and I used him ever since I was using him ever since and then Marion learned to use him also and she, when she was uh, eight years old and she she did, did wonderful with him and then she's been doing it ever since, but she got her own, her own uh, uh, puppets and everything for her, for her own show. And then she did her own show, and her daughter Jenny joined her when she was, I think she was four years old, when she started doing the same thing. And she's very good too. So, also, also, Wonderful. Jessica, mm -hmm. Jessica, her other daughter learned it too, yeah, great. and she can do it very good too. They all have their own puppets. So was this, just one last question then we'll move on, uh, was this, uh, did you ever, did this ever become a career for you, or was it always a, a side hobby that you, uh, that you enjoyed doing? Well, it, it was almost like a career because it was after I, I was, uh, retired from from working in the in the wallet factory Great. so I was retired from that so it was almost like a a career or something because I was doing it for since 1976 Great. that's when I sent for my little boy <laughs> in 1976 Wonderful. that's when and then I started sent for booklets on information mm -hmm. and, a, and a record explaining how to do it. So that's the way I learned. I learned by myself. But then she started, she practiced and she started when she was eight years old and she did so well. I left her take over the whole show when we entertained together. She and I and, and my other daughter, Suzanne, was entertaining with us. Wonderful. So, Marion, let's switch mm -hmm. to you. What drew you to uh, doing ventriloquism at such at eight years old? What uh, what sparked the uh, interest? Mm. Well, I think just the that it was something different. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed just um, being in front of people and kind of um, it it seemed like a good mesh for my personality <laughs> even um, and uh, I think just the intrigue of it you know it was something novel and uh, no one else I knew was doing anything like that you know right. and so when my mom had that idea and we got our first character I just started practicing and trying different um, skits and she ordered a lot of script books right away to kind of get us started and kind of give us uh, it, those were extremely helpful because as a beginner we really didn't know where to start. Were you involved because they, they've actually just rebooted did, was one of the courses you may have learned from the mayor course? We didn't no although that's where we ordered our, our ventriloquist material from mm -hmm. we just were more so self-taught really Great. and so just um, tried it on our own and then before you know it we were um, doing little things at church little things for Sunday school and, and then in a talent contest uh, right little talent contests through the local just local opportunities you know and 
and again, it was just something so novel and different, you know, and uh, which kind of spurred me on to learn more and to try more. And um, so then it opened up more doors of opportunity. Uh, we would travel and um, do programs at um, senior citizen groups and, like I said, churches, community events. And so it just kind of the domino effect started taking place, you know, where more people would hear about us and, um, and um, so we ended up you know, birthday parties that sort of kind of started sort of small and um, and then just continued on from there. Wonderful. And then Jenny, uh, seeing mother and grandmother, when did you decide, okay, I'm going to try this four years old, as Evelyn said? Yeah. Well, ever since I was little, my mom had been doing it and I was always watching her and watching her practice and seeing her little shows and when I was four years old, I came up to her and I said, I think I could do this too. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember just showing her that I had been kind of practicing and that I could, you know, kind of do the skill. And then she really helped teach me and helped me start working with different characters and just developing different voices and making the character look alive and come up with scripts. And it really, I think, it helped just develop a confidence and stage presence even at that young of age. So, I mean, when I was four, I would just sort of come along to the shows, watch and help, you know, in small bits. And then as I got a little bit older, I got my first puppet and would perform for senior citizen groups and mm -hmm. small events and... Um, and churches. Yep, and churches. And now we do... Churches, libraries, schools, festivals. You perform all that. over. When when was the spark that you said, okay, join mm -hmm. join my show, or, or that maybe you asked, can I can I come on stage with you and, and try this? When did you start working as a duo? Well, I think just when people would see, it was more so even the audience who really loved to see their reaction to their it. reaction to her. Mm -hmm. um, really, uh, I I thought, boy, we really have have something here because she she was such a draw especially for children in the audience for them to see a peer up there doing mm -hmm. that you yeah. know and uh, and she really did a very good job she was very comfortable there in front of the audience interacting with kids and even when we do you know simple walk arounds and be, maybe in between a show or before a show kids and people would be drawn to the character and to Jenny and just that that kind of um reaction from the audience we just thought you know what this is this is really really something neat let's continue with this and and Jenny's motivation to want to do it of course was a driving force you know I wasn't going to force her to you know expect her that you've got to do this because I've done it my mom's done it you know only if you want to yeah. and she wanted to and she just so we just kind of became a, a mother-daughter team and traveled all over Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey, Dun Maryland, Shire, Maryland, yeah. Delaware, yeah, just mostly northeastern PA or northeastern United States. Awesome. And Evelyn, did did Marion ever perform with you when uh, when you when you were performing? Did she ever join you? Uh, for years, we would we. That's how we started. Then, right when, when my mom. Yeah. So we, my mom and I, performed together for years throughout my high school years we would travel and she would sign me out of high school and we go do a a show for a senior citizen group and then she'd sign me back into high school so that was kind of our life we it really and Suzanne joined and us, our, like my Su Suzanne did gymnastic routines to music oh cool that was her part of our entertaining mm -hmm. we did a little bit of a variety show but then um, I went off to college and I kind of put it on the back burner for a little bit um, and uh, but then I was studying to be a um, I was an elementary ed special ed major, mm -hmm. and so um, I started seeing the use for puppetry with teaching, and so I used it in my classroom, and I would you know bring out my characters as a 
kind of a reward for the kids. And, um, and then I started having my students write puppet scripts. And we would, I used it as a writing grade and a working together as a group grade. That's awesome. And um, so my kids, so we would do that. Um, and so, and they always had, it had to have a moral, you know, whether it was being responsible or being respectful or, you know, anti-bullying. And so um, my students, these, I taught fifth grade. So these are my fifth grade students. And I was amazed at how many kids loved puppets and they worked together in groups and they wrote these scripts. And then during our recess time, we'd go set up and we'd perform for other grade levels. Awesome. Yeah, so as a kindergarten class, we'd come down and we'd do our routines for them, and so it was just so much fun. Did that spark any interest in uh, your students into looking into ventriloquism that you... Well, kind of I, I. it's funny because now, I mean, that was back in the early 90s, so now these kids are now grown and they have families so like they'll come to a show they'll say Mrs. Gaiman we remember you you know <laughs> doing puppets in the classroom so it just kind of brings back good memories I'm, I don't know um, I don't know if, uh, you know whether that they you know were inspired to go on but but we sure had a good time. And it sure impacted them. And so that brings me to Jenny being, you know, the, the younger one, as they say, about drawing the kids in, as Mary mm -hmm. was talking about. Yeah. Uh, what have you seen about I influencing kids as a kid yourself coming up and doing ventriloquism? Well, like my mom said, too, I think it was really neat for them to see up here on stage and kind of be able to see that it's not just something that you have to be an adult and you have to be doing it for you know most of your life I mean I had just started when I was around their age and I it was something that I could do and a lot of the things that I would teach in my skits and in my songs were just the fact that there's so many things that you can do if you put your mind to it and so I think a lot of it was just about encouraging the kids like even if it's not ventriloquism, everyone has different talents and abilities that they can use. So I think it was just kind of a way to encourage kids being able to see me doing something that I love and then also teaching them as well. Wonderful. And Evelyn, what kind of programs, when, when you were performing, what kind of programs would you uh, devise and, and perform? What kind of, what was the message in your show? Well, I, I did programs for church and then I'd have my puppets sing uh, songs like the little the little boy would uh, my little, no the little man would sing I've got the joy 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 down in my heart you know I'd have him sing that I've got the joy 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 and uh, and the little the old lady that I have the grandma and she sings, I'm a happy little old granny, and <laughs> as happy as can be because I got the love, and, the love of Jesus right inside of me. I'd have them sing songs that would be appropriate for the church, in the church, for yes. the church service. So the church programs Absolutely. were church. gospel oriented. Um, other programs were just plain humor oriented, yeah. just get yes. the audience laughing and. Yes. You know. yeah. And they. They really laughed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you entertained with Chester, oh, they yeah. like oh, they like <laughs> Chester so much. Chester's my Dutchified mouse. Yeah. And so again, just you know, there's a lot of times something Steve Axtell refers to when you, when you pick up a character, mm -hmm. the, the magic moment. I think there's a ton of magic moments in this art form. When did you go from I just want to try this because mm -hmm. it's cool and I see it around my house mm -hmm. to I want to do this. This is what I would like to continue to do. And that, that's really for both of you, all three of you, if you'd like. When did you decide, I'm going to go down this path? Hmm. Um, I, I think, I don't know if any of you want to chime in, but um, I think that I just saw, um, just there was a niche for it. There was, um, people just seemed so drawn to it, that they just were so intrigued by the art form that um, that alone, just, you know, that the phone started ringing and, mm -hmm. you know, I think, wow, this is really something that not only I love, but that there's opportunity there. And um, that, that to me just was kind of the, 
the um, maybe the spark that started things that I loved it people you know it was that mesh of this is something I love there's opportunity and people are calling and you know so that kind of I thought wow you know what there's really something here and um, I was trying to balance I was school teacher I was starting a family mm -hmm. so I was I had a lot of things so I had to kind of put it on hold a little bit and uh, perhaps I haven't traveled and done as much as maybe I would like to mm -hmm. but it's all it's all in God's timing I, I am not trying to you know I do not see um, I, I cannot um, uh, how should I say it um, I can't look into maybe traveling right now, but maybe in time I will. Absolutely. And um, what I've seen recently is there's been a lot of opportunity for teaching for me, where um, a lot of places now have, have asked me to come and teach ventriloquism. So you talked about influencing other people. Um, those opportunities have recently opened up. Um, I was recently chosen to be the artist in residence at a local school district. Awesome. And so they hired me to be the artist in residence in this school for the school year. So I went and I taught puppetry to fifth and sixth graders, about mm -hmm. 400 kids over the entire school year. Wow. So it was amazing. We built our own little puppets. Um, I taught them the art. I showed them clips of ventriloquists. We talked about just the dynamics. We talked about lip sync. We talked about eye contact. We talked about believable action and entrances and exits we did a little performance and they had an end-of-the-year art show and I did a little performance and then we were showing videos of the kids of us kind of a documentary of what we've done that's throughout really cool. the year so oh, that was a phenomenal opportunity um, and then another lady was at a show and she said hey she's in a um, an inner city Reading school and she said we have um, we have kids who are interested in puppetry. Would you come in and teach them? And so I've been going in this past year and teaching these kids how to do puppetry. And so they have like kids clubs on, I believe it's Tuesday nights, and then they were using their puppetry throughout these kids clubs. Um, just an inner city opportunity, you know? And that must feel really good for you. I love it. I just love it. It's a perfect blend of teaching, which I love to do, and puppetry, which I love to do. Um, just this past week, um, I was in Philly. There's something called Club Philly, mm -hmm. and they bring in kids from um, all over, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and they come in to um, uh, Newtown, actually. And um, so we train them in a lot of different art forms, whether it's balloon animals to... Um, uh, art um, to ventriloquism to puppetry and then we train them just in um, different art forms and then they go out and do ministry in Philly using these different art forms but communicating the gospel through that so I was I was teaching them ventriloquism I, I was the ventriloquism component of it that's so awesome. and then I had another lady who's a grandma who just said you know what I've always wanted to be a ventriloquist would you teach me? So I have a private, I'm a, I have a private uh, student now, and so she's been coming for a couple months, and I've been teaching her how to do ventriloquism. So, uh, so again, it's just that's been a really neat kind of opening for me. Um, I'd love to do more of that too. It's wonderful. And in nine, in 1984, we were on, on TV on a, a cafe. It was called Cafe International. And it, Walt Brawler had charge of the show, and I had met him before that, and um, and uh, he plays the accordion, and I I was playing the accordion too at that time, but anyway, and uh, we were we did part of the show with on TV, and I have a video of it uh, from 1984, the first time <laughs> we were ever. Uh, that was Suzanne and Marion and me. It was a local Brooks County television, awesome. PCTV. So it was a local. It's so cool what you, what you three get to do as a family. And so, and so Jenny, that, that spark that, that, okay, you go from the kid just mm -hmm. wanting to try, you know, I, I presume what, what, what your mom was doing to mm -hmm. saying, wow, I really enjoy this. Yeah. I'm going to stick with it. What, what was that moment for you? Um, I think 
it wasn't necessarily a specific moment, but just sort of developed over time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was immediately intrigued with it when I saw my mom doing it and when I started doing it. And I just, I kept doing it with her and I learned to really love it. And I love, you know, being able to perform in front of people and see people laugh and see people really enjoy watching what I do and I think that's something that's very encouraging especially for someone younger like me to see people Mm -hmm. really think it's fascinating and I've done different talent shows and things like that and just be able to you can do a very good job of it thank you they enjoy you (laughs) you very much too yeah I think like my mom had said just seeing getting a positive response from the audience and seeing how much they love it and how much kids love being inspired by it. I think that's what kind of makes me want to... Why do you think it reaches kids so much? Why do you think it just kind of, it it sparks something in them? Yeah, I think, well, I think besides the fact that, like we said, they're seeing a peer do something too, I think it's just so fun and the characters are so kid-friendly. We have um, a giant mouse and a life-size ostrich. Um, I have a bright yellow duck Mm -hmm. who's just a lot of fun. And so very family-friendly, kid-friendly humor. And I think it's just something they don't necessarily see all the time. It's different than the jugglers or (coughs) magicians or, you know, bands that they might watch. But it's something fun too. Well, we often talk to the kids about using their imagination, you know, and so I often do that during shows. I just talk to them about, think about the things that you can do, the things that you can um, imagine. You can build your own puppet, and I, te- I kind of take them through the steps of, this is what you could do at home, you know, mm-hmm. and so I build a little puppet during the show, you know, and I just yeah. talk to them about, this is what you could do. Um, I even take, I even pull out um, a macaroni and cheese box, and I say, how many of you have seen this, you know, and then I tell them, you know, with the help of an adult, you know, you can cut open the back, fold it in half, and then I bring out one that's been covered with felt, and it looks like a little dinosaur, you know, I say, yeah. look at this, even something simple as a macaroni and cheese box, you could re- use recyclable materials, you know, go green, and, you know, and and uh, build up your puppet and use your imagination, give it voices, you know. So we've done, I've done ventriloquist camps, I've done that, a summer camp of ventriloquism and puppetry, and I've taught kids and, you know, build our own puppets that way. So there's been a lot of opportunity that way to teach other kids. One thing, um, too, that kind of going along with um, influencing kids and um, I think too that the puppets are so approachable. Mm-hmm. Where kids, and we see it with adults, they come up and they talk to the puppet very freely, mm-hmm. you know, more so than us, you yeah. know. And they'll ask pup- the puppet questions, and it's just so approachable for the most part, you know, for kids. And um, like Jenny said, we're purposeful with the type of puppets that we choose, you know, because one of the most important things is to know your audience. You know, our audience are children and families. That's our target audience. So therefore that drives, you know, the puppets we choose, the scripts we choose, the songs, the music, the everything we choose from there is driven by our target audience. Um, one thing that we've done is um, we've also developed um, a puppet uh, or a show theme called All Kids Belong. Mm -hmm. And it's um, designed actually, again, out of necessity. We were doing a show at an elementary school and a um, the guidance counselor came up to us and said, you know, we have had such an influx influx of um, students with autism, with special needs coming into our school. Could, do you have any programs that we could address it to the whole population to talk to the whole school population about these kids to make them just be um, more educated more educated about these special needs kids and I said I have some ideas I was a special education teacher said I've got some ideas and then she said could we meet and I sat down with her and the two of us she gave me some thoughts and some needs that she wanted addressed 
And we ended up writing a whole program, an assembly program, based on um, addressing special needs kids in a school. Would you recommend sort of going about that by getting in contact with, with other educators to, to develop a program like that? Because I know a lot of times, for me and for others, it's just where do you start? Right. You know, where do you start when you're developing an educational program? Right. And it sounds like it was so beneficial to you to have that, to have somebody that, right. that wanted something very specific. Right. And it was out of necessity. You mm -hmm. know, she came to me, something clicked with her after seeing our, and I think we were doing a reading assembly about the importance of reading, mm -hmm. and something clicked with her and she said, you know what? What about this, you know? And so again, it was that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention sort of thing. And so she she saw the need for it. But yeah, so there we were. And and again, knowing your audience. Once I knew her needs and what she her expectations, the the boundaries that she wanted, um, you know, once I could work within those boundaries of this is what she's looking for, um, these are you know, these are some things that she wants, some topics that she wants addressed. Yeah. Because it can be a delicate, going into a school is not, you know, you can't go in there with a comedy club material, <laughs> right. you know. Right. You need to really be sensitive. And especially um, coming at that angle with um, addressing the needs of special um, needs students in mm -hmm. the school. Um, so it really was, it really ended up, being a wonderful opportunity and so we've used that now in different schools and we present that in different schools and um, my youngest daughter has um, special needs and so in the assembly um, she's in a wheelchair and Jenny um, does a skit about being a sibling of a child with special needs and she talks about her sister and she talks to the kids about um, that how her she can't eat like they do and that she has a feeding tube and um, that she doesn't talk and that she's blind and that her legs don't work like theirs do and that she's in a wheelchair and then she says if you'd like to meet my sister she's here today and so then um, we have a nurse that comes along and a nurse um, rolls my other daughter out in, in her wheelchair and then we open it up to Q&A and the audience the kids are so transparent and they ask such phenomenal questions not only about ventriloquism like how does that puppet talk but you know really about well how does your daughter play with toys and just all of these great questions and so ventriloquism has now become kind of the door that has opened up to have kids you know say hey you know what my uncle's in a wheelchair and so like it just opens up this incredible Incredible, brilliant conversation and with I kids. I think kind of the best part of it is that it it introduces such a serious topic in sort of a light manner that they can mm -hmm. be, you know, have fun at first with the characters and really get into it as opposed to just coming in and presenting a PowerPoint about kids with disabilities. Right. It really yeah. it helps that it draws their attention in and helps them kind of feel relatable as the characters are talking about, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to understand too, and right. it, it makes it more kid-friendly and right. relatable. And another thing, when we started out, we didn't know any other woman that's a ventriloquist. Right. That one, one other man we know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you knew that guy, mm -hmm. one guy that we knew. That's all. It, it, it's not very popular. It didn't seem very popular among women mm -hmm. doing mentorship. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was debating whether or not to, to bring this sort of side of things up. But it, it's... And uh, it's so unique to see three generations of female ventriloquists. Yes. And it, but it's so awesome, too. <laughs> so can you, I, I don't want to delve too deep in, into this side of things just because yeah. of treading on toenails and stuff, but um, being women in this business, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there are so many male ventriloquists. Well, just some perspectives on that. Being. Yeah. Um. It's a little rare, I yeah. think. <laughs> yeah. Where it's true. I, although I think with the internet, you get to see a few more, yes. you know, female ventriloquists out there. Uh, but you're right. It does seem kind of male dominant. With um, I think yeah. I think I mean, I think maybe the one side of it is that 
not that it's necessarily more appropriate for what we do, but I mean, male ventriloquists are often common in more the comedy club settings and doing, you know, Saturday Night Live or yeah. whatever mm-hmm. they do. And so this being females and talking to children, it kind of maybe comes off in a more soft and motherly Maternal. type. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's certainly it certainly helps. There are just statistically more female educators than, than right. male educators. So it it really does, as you say, Jenny, really does sort of match up very well with the types of, of programs that mm-hmm. you do. And Evelyn, I was thinking as Marianne was talking, that you must be so proud as the mother and grandmother of this family of of uh, ventriloquists. I, I am. I often think of her. I think, oh, I'm so proud of her mm-hmm. that she followed in my footsteps, you might say, and she's doing the same thing. And also, her two daughters are doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. They followed after her then. So, but I'm the one that started the whole... You had the spark. This yeah. business. Yeah. It's a, and it's incredible. And now, if I read your website correctly, you left teaching, and now you do this full-time. Right, right. When, as full-time as I can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the decision, uh, what were the factors in that decision? I love to talk about people that go from one career mm-hmm. to this. Mm-hmm. The factor in that decision to say, okay, I'm all in. Uh, uh, well, um, actually, it was more so driven by um, our youngest daughter. Okay. Because of her medical needs, mm-hmm. um, I was, we had four young children, and, um, and then when she came along, we were in and out of the hospital quite a bit, and right. so I had to quit teaching, not because... I wanted to go into the field of ventriloquism, but because of her needs and her care. And so that is what took me out of teaching. Right. Um, our young family and a, a child with a lot of medical needs. And so um, actually it caused me to put everything, ventriloquism, on hold for quite a few years. And um, so things started to, I, I still was dabbling in it and doing some shows here and there but really things really started to blossom once Jenny started joining joining me and the opportunities started to come in and more and more and more and um, so I just kind of I just kind of couldn't help myself but but to get back involved in it and um, so it was finding a balance of my husband staying home watching the other children while Jenny and I could go out and do shows and um, and so my youngest daughter continues to need care Mm -hmm. and so again that has just being a mom of four children and one who you know needs a lot of care that again has just um, you know kept me from, you know, pursuing it on more of a career level, you know, although I'm doing as much as I can, given the situation, you know, for now. So it's all in timing. All in timing. And and Jenny, just just to you, are you performing now? Are you doing your own shows or are you you still just the duo or have you started to go off and Um, do your own programs? Well, I'm still just part of the show Mm -hmm. for the most part. um, I have my own skit in it and um, we had a skit where we would both perform together and do a duet where she had a character and I had a character and her character was kind of encouraging my character who's very self-conscious but um, <laughs> yeah. um, I've, I've started to work on my own skits that I can perform for different um, events and yeah and I was selected as the outstanding young woman for my school, so wow. I'll be um, representing my school with ventriloquism. So I'm working on my own skit where I can, you know, use it by myself and do my own skit for that competition as well. That is incredible. Well, we have hit everything in, so, in record time. I always close with this question, though. Um, the thing that you would like to see from uh, ventriloquists coming up, the, uh, the what's missing or, or what you would like to see from this wonderful art form. I'll start with Evelyn and we'll go, we'll go around. Well, I, I would like to see her being able to continue doing what she is doing, mm-hmm. even if she has to do it by herself, and if mm-hmm. Jenny is away at college and can't be with her, I, I hope that she will continue doing it even, even on her own, maybe. Absolutely. 
or that you will continue mm -hmm. in the future? I think too, just continuing um, quality of the craft. Mm -hmm. You know, continue to um, just aspire to greatness. Um, I think just um, there is, there's a lot of, um, there's so much opportunity there. And so, um, yeah, just um, my, my encouragement to other ventriloquists is continue to ex aspire to, to greatness. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Jenny? And I think for myself, I would like to um, be able to do what my mom does and what my grandmother does. My mom has many more character voices and different abilities and doing different skits and songs that I'm still learning. So I think to just, you know, keep working, setting personal goals. So I think that would be my word of advice where if you have someone to look up to um, who, you know, you're working towards being at the similar skill level yeah. to them that you set personal goals and like, well, I'm still, I'm not at that level yet, but I'm working on my own skills, so. That's wonderful. Yes, always keep growing and maybe, maybe more generations of ventriloquists to come. That, that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Evelyn. And thank you, Jenny. Thank you again to Marion, Jenny, and of course, Evelyn, for inviting all three of us into her home so that we could all talk together. I wanted to jump back to the studio to touch on a few quick things before we get out of here. First and foremost, a correction to last week's episode. Nate Puppets is from Cleveland, Ohio. I had incorrectly stated on the episode that he was from Columbus. So my sincerest apologies to Nate for that mix-up. Remember to you listeners that sometime this week, episodes 3 through 37 will be removed from iTunes and Podomatic. You can find our archives at ventriloquismweekly.com, and the archives are actually on YouTube, linked through to the website, so you can go to YouTube and search Ventriloquism Weekly, and it's actually pretty cool if you search for some of our guests. A lot of times, the episodes are just like the fourth or fifth video down, and uh, very rarely have I had to go to the second page to find one of our episodes if you search for a specific performer that we've had on the show. So that's a really neat, uh, a neat treat to have with uh, how I did the tags for putting them on YouTube. So you can really find us. We're really going to stay everywhere, even though only the four most recent episodes will stay on iTunes. And that's important for you listeners who have the uh, episodes downloaded to uh, your iPhone, have them automatically come down and get put on your iPhone. I don't know how it all works because I don't have an iPhone. But uh, I was talking with somebody who said, yeah, I get the, the shows uh, put right on the phone. They come automatically download once they're up. And uh, I just want you to make sure that you have them downloaded to your phone and it's just not a renewal of the subscription and that they would disappear from your phone when they disappear from iTunes. So please check up on that and make sure you have everything that you want if you're getting us from iTunes uh, before they all disappear, or at least uh, everything up until Russ Lewis's episode. And remember, ventriloquismweekly.com, you can find every single episode. I update that site constantly. And lastly, I want to mention once again that the two and only Jay Johnson's Tony-winning show will be released August 1st, almost a month from today, considering tomorrow is July 1st. Please get this news to go viral. It is such a beautifully done piece of theater and a beautifully recorded film. 54 million households go in demand August 1st. Go, Jay, go. And that's it for us this week. Next week, the great Sammy King will be joining us. A reminder, you can find all you need to know about Ventriloquism Weekly by visiting our mothership, ventriloquismweekly.com. Reach out by emailing ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com and find our group on Facebook by searching Ventriloquism Weekly hyphen podcast for ventriloquists. Tweet us at talk for two, and if you tweet about the show, use hashtag talk for two. Signing off for Ventriloquism Weekly, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding all you vents out there to keep talking for two. <laughs>